sustainer. And if you know your Bible, you've most likely heard of Psalms 23, where David, this is a Psalm of David, and it's a song. And in Psalms 23, it says, you must be familiar with this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art, my, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And with that thought in mind, we'll go back into it here in a second. But with that thought in mind, I want to read a story in 2 Kings chapter 4. With that thought in mind that the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. And the rest that follows. And some of you may have heard this story before and some of you may have not. I remember hearing it as a young boy. And in, for, and in 2 Kings chapter 4, it says, this is, the, this is Elisha speaking now. And it says, Now there cried a certain women of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to, to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil, except a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few, means get, get a lot, get as many as you can. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out, and it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. And what that means at the end, it basically says, sell, sell the rest, pay any debt you have, and then you and your children can live off of whatever, whatever else was, was given to you, whatever else was the excess. So to really unpack this, uh, this set of verses right here, it's only seven short verses in chapter 4, 2 Kings. Um, we see that the woman here was a, was a wife of the sons of the prophets. So she, was, she must have been a, an, an important woman if she was the son of a prophet. Um, and she knew Elisha. So Elisha must have been ministering in the area. This is in the area of, uh, of Shunem and, um, and Gilgal. This is a certain area in Israel at the time. And um, her husband had died. So it was just her and her two sons which we see down uh, still in the, the bottom of verse 1. Now, in the, Levit in the Levitical law, uh, I think it's in chapter 29, 25, in Leviticus chapter 25, I'm not going to go all into that, but the Jewish law stated that if, if you had debt to pay and you couldn't pay it, you were to give up your children, and your children would pay your debt for you, basically, and, that, and that's the way that it worked. They, your children would become that, that creditor's or that debtor's servant. And so they became the debt. And so to pay the debt, because her husband was dead, and they couldn't pay their bills anymore, uh, or whatever it was they, they needed in life, their, her two sons were going to leave. So she was obviously fearful that her husband had already passed. What was she going to do? Now her sons were going to be taken away from her. So, um, but she said that her husband feared the Lord. So her husband may have known Elisha. We don't know this for a fact. But he knew God because he feared the Lord here in verse number one. And then it says, 
Um, e Elisha, and she's crying out to Elisha because the, the, third, the third word in the very first verse says, now they're crying. So she was crying unto the Lord. You know, I just had my firstborn son. He's crying all the time. It just, it just is the way it is. Not all the time, but, you know, he cries every few hours and stuff like that. And they cry when they want something. One thing that's, that's taught me here in the last week or two is that we cry to God when we need something. With physical tears, with our mouth, with our heart, with our soul, with our spirit, with everything in our being, we cry to our Heavenly Father when we need something. And so she was crying uh, unto Elisha at the time because he was the prophet of God. And so he was the one that was ministering for the Lord there in that area. And then it says, Elisha says that, what, what, what do you want? What can I do for you? That's basically what he's saying here. Um, and he asks her, what do you have in your house? And she basically responds with, well, I don't have anything. Except I have this little pot of oil. That's all she had. And one thing I wrote here in my Bible when I was studying this is the Lord only wants all that you have. He wants everything that you have. He wants all that you have. He wants only what you have. And he can use that and he can take exactly what you have and what you give him and he can multiply it into the impossible that you didn't think could, could happen, but except with the Lord and through faith in him. And again, here in, in verse 2, um, she says she has, she has nothing except the pot of oil. So then in verse 3, she says, uh, this is Elisha speaking again. He says, he tells her to have great faith here. This is basically what she's, what's, what's he saying. And he says, go borrow the vessels abroad from all thy neighbors, even the empty vessels, and just get as many as you possibly can. So here you see that, that the Lord um, and Elisha is asking her to have great faith to go and get all the vessels in the village, in the area, in the town that she lived at. So that way he could do a great miracle. And then it says, um, it, it, it talks about when she comes back, shut the door and pour the vessels out. And you'll see that once, once you do, they will be full again. And eventually it comes to pass uh, in verse 6 and 7 that... Miraculously, the oil ves the, the vessels just are full of oil, and she doesn't know why. And it's it's a it's a miracle. It's just the same way that Jesus um, filled the vats with wine at the wedding feast, and it's the same way that Jesus turned you know two loaves and five fishes into a multitude for for all of those people. He performed those miracles for us, and even in today's day and age, we we combat we combat. People that don't think that we have a God of miracles. And I speak so many times to people in the secular world out, outside of these walls throughout the rest of the world. Seven billion people. And in America, not to get too much off the topic, but in America, 99% of kids that grow up in public school are taught about evolution. That automatically means, whether they have a faith background or not, that means that we don't have a God of miracles. God, if he snapped everything else into existence and he raised his own son, Jesus Christ, from the dead, surely he could create all this world in six literal days with his fingers, just like that. He could do it because he's God. And he did it for this woman. And he, he was her sustainer. That's what I want us to look at now. So that's the story of the Shunammite woman. And going back into Psalms 23... It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The shepherd was the, he was the one that took care of the sheep. Because sheep are dumb. And they don't know where they're going. So they need a shepherd. They need somebody to keep them uh, secure. They need somebody to keep them safe. They need somebody to guide them. And so the Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. We can apply this to us today. And we can put ourselves in the Shunammite woman's shoes to where maybe we've lost everything. But maybe we only have one little thing left. And maybe, maybe I've been there before. I surely was there in, in recent days where I, felt like I, where I felt like I had nothing. And yet the Lord came through. And he was my shepherd. He was my sustainer. He was my safeguard. He was my defender. He was all these things that David talks about. And if you remember, David was a, was a king. But yet before that, he was a shepherd. So he understood this more than anyone. He was able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I, I do not even want anything. That's what he's saying. 
He says, because, because I have God, He's my salvation, what else do I need in this life? If I have salvation, that's all that I need. And it says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and He leadeth me beside the still water. So He giveth us rest, and He provides water for us. What, what, is, what does the Lord say that He is? He says that He is the, the ever-flowing water. He's a waterfall of, of whatever it is that we need. His blessings and His mercies endureth forever. His grace and mercy be upon us. And it says that in chapter, uh, verse number 3 in chapter 23, it says, He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which we all come upon in our life. We all go through the valley of the shadow of death. That could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It could be literal death. It could be a suffering. It could be many different things. Um, because our, our devil, the adversary, seeketh about to destroy us. And he's the great destroyer. But praise the Lord, we have the great sustainer. And Jesus Christ and the Lord our God and Father and the Holy Spirit all together is our sustainer. And that word sustain means to uphold, to defend, to suffer for somebody else's sake. And so when I think about the Lord sacrificing his own son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and pay for our sins, I think about what it would take for me to sacrifice for my own son now that, now that I'm a father. And I'm, and I'm sure many of you mothers and fathers in here would do anything it took to sacrifice for your children. And I know that's how I feel now. So I have a feeling, that sense that, that, I have, that, that God has given me something. And it says in, ch- in verse number five, Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of even mine enemies. Thou anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. One, one of the sayings that I like to say in, in, in Christian faith is that we are filled by God to be spilled by God. So we are continually regenerated, renewed, filled and we get, we get, we're like a cup. We're like a vessel. That's what God says. We're, we're, the, we're the clay. He's the potter. So he's making us into a pot of clay, per se. And he wants to just put his spirit inside of us so that we, we, we could be, we, when we're filled, we could then be spilled for others' sakes and for his sake. And in verse number six, it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so what really could we want more than to have goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life here on this, on this earth and to dwell in the house of the Lord. Here, we're in the house of God today. But when we die and we're in heaven with the Lord, then we surely will be in the real house of the Lord forever. And I wrote down some notes that I want you all to think about with this, with this, uh, with this message. And just a few points that I want to go down. In Colossians 1.17, it says that by all things, or by Him, all things consist. So the Lord puts everything together and holds everything together for Himself and for us. And so He sustains us by His mighty right hand, uh, His righteous right hand in Isaiah 41.10. And in Isaiah 40.30, He says that He sustains us by wings of, e- by wings of eagles. He will, he will help us to soar on wings of eagles. What does that mean? There's a lot in there to that. But he saves us basically from, from death and destruction. And we know that he's, he's destroyed that at the cross. In, uh, in Matthew 6, 26, he even sustains this sparrow. And it says that if, if God will even take care of the sparrow and feed the sparrow, how much more shall he give to us if we only ask? Uh, in John 14, 26, it says that uh, he will send us the comforter which is the Holy Spirit. And that will sustain us. That is, a, that is a further sustainment of himself. And for so many thousands of years, David, Noah, 120 years, Joseph um, in Egypt in captivity and Daniel in the lion's den, he sustained all of them for his good pleasure. Why? Because in Isaiah 55, 8 verses 9, it says that his ways are above our ways. And we don't always know what we're going through or why we're going through it. But the Lord has a good purpose in the end for him to get glory ultimately. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says that 
He suffered until death for the joy that was set before him, which is the cross. And so he, he sustained that cross. He suffered that cross for our sake. And in 1 Peter, here's a great verse for anyone. It says in 1 Peter 5, 7, to cast all your care on him for he careth for you. So we know that he's the burden taker. We're called to be, uh, we're called to be burden sharers. And we, and we, as Christians, we share in other people's burdens. Anyone in here that you see in the hall, your neighbor, your roommate, whatever it is, a family member, you can share in their burden by simply even just praying for them. Silently, aloud, you might not be able to do much, but God only asks of us all that we can. And we don't have to do much because he's the great God that we have in heaven. And so we see that even our breath in Isaiah 42, 5 comes from the Lord. We couldn't even breathe if it wasn't for God. So he sustains us all of our life. I think of when I was when I was researching this verse um, and this do, doing a study on this, this message, I think. Man, I was I was a baby just like my son one day and now I'm 31 years old and many of you, the Lord has sustained us for so long and he will continue to sustain us until he's done with us, until the race is finished, until he's until he's ready to call us home. And lastly, every good and perfect gift cometh down from the father of life. From the Father of lights, who giveth to all men liberally, in James, there it is, in, 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 uh, in James 1. And He can give you sustainment. He can be your defender. He can give you love and mercy and grace in all of those things that you need. He can, he can be your comforter. He can be our sustainer. And so with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this message, Lord. I thank you for these dear people here today. I pray, Lord, that you would sustain them in many miraculous ways. There's nothing that I can do physically as a, as a human being, Lord, but uh, you can save their souls, Lord, and you can do miracles that are far beyond anything that we humans can do. And we thank you for sending your Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross and pay for our sins. Lord, I pray that this message was a help to these people, and I pray that it would continually be on their minds that you are their great sustainer. And that you would bind the devil, the great destroyer, and that you would bind demons and principalities and powers, Lord. And that you would encourage your people here today, Lord, to continue to just seek your face and know that your mercies are new every day. And Lord, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.